A very warm welcome to the uh, Crown Plaza London City for this Brexit and Standards event hosted by BSI, the British Standards Institution. I'm David Bell, I'm the Director of Standards Policy at BSI and it's a great pleasure to welcome you here today. Um, there's a lot of interest in this topic, you won't be surprised to hear. We have in the room uh, lots of people who are involved in the development of standards, lots of people who are using standards, lots of businesses who are exporting and are concerned about uh, what exporting looks like post-Brexit. We even have an MP here. Um, who's here to learn, if not to teach, but um, uh, not from the government side, uh, before you try and uh, ask too many difficult questions. Um, and we're going to run today's session in two parts. So first of all, we're going to talk about the situation today, uh, as far as Brexit is concerned. Uh, we can have an address from the EEF, the Manufacturers' Organisation, and then from BSI, and that's going to explore the current political situation um, from a business perspective, but also look at the current standards position as well. So you probably have read already BSI's Brexit position paper, copies of which are outside, but Scott Steedman can update you um, on that. There'll be opportunities to ask questions of both of our keynote speakers as soon as they've finished, so please let me know, indicate clearly that you want to speak, and we've got roving mics, and we'll uh, make sure you get a chance to, to, to be heard. Secondly, we've got a, a panel session, and that's really forward-looking. That's looking at post-Brexit opportunities uh, for international trade and the role that standards will play. Um, so we're looking forward to your, your input to that. We've got some excellent uh, speakers, some experts from the world of trade policy, uh, from compliance and from business who will give us their perspectives and try the best they can to answer your questions about where we are. And then we're going to have lunch, and at lunch there's further opportunities to discuss with the BSI uh, staff present. Um, I, I think I'd like to introduce, before we start, Richard Collin. Uh, Richard is BSI's expert on Brexit and standards, so if you haven't already met Richard, uh, please find him at lunchtime, and I'm sure he'll be pleased to answer any questions. So that's Richard Collin. We do have a Richard Collins registered. Um, I'm sure he's an expert as well, but please don't harangue him. Harangue this Richard instead. He's the person to talk to. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Stephen Phipps and CBE. Stephen has been Chief Executive of the EEF, the Manufacturers' Organisation, uh, since December 2017. He came to EEF from Government, where he worked in the Department for International Trade, providing UK government export support to the UK defence and security industry. And before that, he was in the Home Office. And prior to that, he spent 35 years in a range of large and small advanced manufacturing companies. And he was awarded CBE for services to the security industry in 2010. And we're very pleased he can be with us today. Uh, so please welcome our keynote speaker, Stephen Phipson. Well, very, very good morning. Is the mic working? It is good. Excellent. And uh, it's great to be here. Thank you very much for that, for that introduction. Um, so I'm absolutely delighted to be here. We're going to talk a little bit about the political background to Brexit. Just a word on EEF, perhaps, to start with, so you, you understand where we sit and the way that government is engaging in business engagement, just to set the context. Um, so there are, government recognises around about 800 trade associations in the country. I think there's probably several thousand in reality, but it's around that sort of number. Um, and basically a couple of years ago, when I was in government, we made, it was a policy decision to really have each department looking after its individual trade bodies. So yoghurt makers are looked after by DEFRA and ADS, which is Defence and Security, is looked after by MOD and things like that. But as we approached Brexit, there was an absolute need to um, talk about national issues, particularly around not just Brexit, but um, things like the, um, um, the overall industrial strategy, skills, those sorts of things. And so there was a, uh, a, a system set up where the five largest national bodies um, had a regular engagement with the cabinet ministers re relative to those um, particular topics. Um, and it's called the B5, and it's reported in the press as the B5. And so EF is part of that. EF represents manufacturing on that committee. And that committee meets every week with Greg Clark. So we've just come straight from the Greg Clark meeting so I can give you a real-time update as to where the Brexit negotiations are this morning. Um, so EF represents manufacturing. CBI represents largely the financial services sector and retail sectors. Um, the FSB represents small and micro businesses. Um, the IOD represents governance. And the Chambers of Commerce represents the 53 regions around the country that we have chambers in. And the chief execs only meeting once a week, every Wednesday, every month with the Chancellor, with Dominic Rabb, and then once every six to eight weeks with the Prime Minister on the Business Council is the way that works. So that gives us a really good opportunity to put the case 
for manufacturing to government. And certainly in the case of standards, earlier in the year it gave us the opportunity to be able to put the case as to why standards are so important. Um, so EF, about 20,000 members, member companies that we represent all over the country. So the oldest one in the country is 125 years old, founded by the Siemens brothers originally, spent most of its time on the big national negotiations, on tribunal negotiations. So it was, we have historic sites. There's one in Edgbaston with a blue plaque on the side of it. It's where the coal miners' strike was negotiated and settled in the 70s. Things like that are sort of in the DNA of, of our organisation. We don't just do lobbying, we actually deliver services. So we have a big HR legal services division where we provide HR support to manufacturing companies. We do that with quite a few businesses. And we are obviously investing in apprentice training because that's one of the key issues for manufacturers. So we have a very large site, so the largest in the country, in Aston in Birmingham, which we've invested in. We're training about 2,000 apprentices there um, for a range of different companies, about 75 companies that it stands at the moment, um, including Jaguar Land Rover, which is the biggest uh, contributor to that particular activity. So um, skills are at the top of the agenda. But lots, lots and lots of things around that which are important. So I think it's clear to say, I mean, it's very, very important to say that EF and BSI, particularly through Scott, have worked very closely on the pol policy changes that Brexit will create in particular. We have an absolute mutual interest in ensuring the UK continues to have the strongest economic relationship with the EU in the future on many, many, many different levels, particularly as, we, as regards to um, uh, the supply chain issues, and we can talk about that in a little bit more detail. Um, Scott, thank you very much for this opportunity and the invitation here today. It's really important that we can share our experiences with your community. So the next few weeks, and I think from this morning, the next week in particular are critical in terms of what's going to happen with Brexit and the future of the relationship with the EU. And um, there's a lot of uh, challenges around that at the moment. Um, the, the shadow of Brexit and the rhetoric of and the prospect of a no deal hangs heavy on many board, boards at the moment, and particularly with our larger members. We see that all the time. Um, it's fair to say that where we are at the moment with the larger manufacturing businesses, most of them now have made very clear plan Bs. Some of them are acting on them, and some of them have started the process of assuming there is a no deal. And that's not very good at the moment in terms of where we are. One of the outcomes that we're seeing is a, is a quite substantial drop-off in investment. People delaying investment decisions. And um, really, um, I think the right ratio we've got at the moment is around 25% drop-off year on year if we look at what's happening now. And as my point was to Secretary of State this morning, we're not going to see the effect of that next year. We're going to see that in 18 months, two years' time in terms of these large investments. And of course, these decisions also affect inward investment, which has been the lifeblood of many of the manu larger manufacturers in this country. Um, most, a lot of them, not most of them, but a lot of them are foreign owned. A lot of them are trying to compete for capital with other European countries. And for the next 12 months, a lot of them have lost out on that battle. So we're seeing investment budgets being cut quite substantially, which is very, very challenging. The other point is the, uh, really the strength of the EU market for the manufacturing sector is absolutely vital. It accounts for 48% of manufactured exports. Absolutely critical. I think we've spent 45 years integrating these together. Um, if you look at our automotive sector, something like about 60% on average content comes from European sources. Um, and basically those supply chains have been optimised over decades. And uh, the UK is a great place to do assembly. But in many cases, if you're buying gearbox, you just be buying them from Germany, where the, where the weight of that technology is. Transferring those types of things to the UK, investing in those in the UK is possible but it would take 10 years to do it. So what do you do in the meantime is often the challenge that most of those sorts of companies think about. So the integrated nature of our supply chains is the critical to manufacturing. The, effect, the effect of a no deal is absolutely um, catastrophic on this sector. Uh, we have 2.7 million people employed. Um, if you want a rough estimate as the effect of a no deal, it's about a million of those jobs. It's quite substantial. And then gradually rebuilding over time. So you'd see a big cliff edge as people move out their manufacturing facilities and, and, and the larger integrators, and then you see a gradual build-up as we recover to whatever that future state may be. So, so for us, putting that case to government is absolutely critical. We only have 170 days to go from where we are at the moment before we leave the EU. And uh, next week, we've got our European leaders gathering together 
to consider the latest developments. Um, and um, uh, from my, I can give you a real-time update from my notes this morning. I can tell you exactly what Secretary of State was saying. Monday is a critical day, so Monday will be yes or no, do we have anything that we can work with? They will be working furiously over the weekend, particularly on the last part of the um, withdrawal agreement, which is around the Irish border, which has two components of negotiation around it. One is um, what checks need to be done, and it's regulatory, not customs. That's quite important. So the press are not reporting that accurately at the moment. And it's who's going to do the checks. Is it British customs officials or is it European customs officials? So on the second point, we've largely got there apparently this morning. It's British. But on the first point, what to check regulatory-wise in factories before those goods leave, this is the whole weekend's negotiation apparently to get to Monday. So, so there's a lot of, lot of thought on that. And then, of course, Wednesday next week is uh, the detail around what's been agreed. So armies of people sitting in rooms over those two days working out exactly the words that describe it, assuming by Monday we get to an agreement. Then on the 17th of November is the final deal. That is the final legal text, which then goes forward for approval, and that's the withdrawal agreement. So it's, it's just the withdrawal agreement. Alongside that, we have committed to have um, the um, heads of terms around the future economic partnership. And so this, this is, the, uh, from our perspective, the so-called checkers deal, um, which we have supported and we have inputted in every week in terms of making sure those borders are frictionless for the reasons I described with manufacturing and making sure that our regulatory alignment stays stays extremely high. Um, diverging from that would be very difficult if you're manufacturing goods to two different regulatory regimes. And certainly those two things were built into what is a proposed white paper at the moment. And um, the other issue is around migration of people, which is absolutely critical to make sure that we have um, the right level of migration. Out of the 2.7 million workers in manufacturing in this country, 350,000 are EU nationals. And uh, they tend not to be low-paid workers. They are in the middle. They're technician level. They are CNC machine operators and programmers. They're tool makers. It's that level of skill. Um, because we haven't been generating enough of our own skills through the apprentice schemes to be able to fill those gaps. So making sure that those things are recognised in our proposal is important. Um, there are in the, uh, apparently in the drawers of the Commission and the Cabinet Office two different deals. One is the Chequers deal, ready to be translated into a um, heads of agreement between the EU and the UK. And the other one is the EU version, which is a Canadian trade deal. So this is where they've got to close the gap. This is the job of all the officials now, to bring those two things together and, and to do it. And the other reassurance we had from Greg this morning was that there is no, no um, compromise at all in what's laid out in the Chequers plan from the UK side. Despite all the media, there is to be no compromise. We are sticking to those principles that are laid out there, which is really, really important. Uh, the other point to mention is that uh, we always get counselled by the Cabinet Ministers that these deals are very complex, and they go through enormous ups and downs, and it wouldn't be at all surprising if over the weekend people walked out the rooms and everything fell apart a couple of times before they got to Monday, um, and we saw that a little bit in Salzburg, uh, but um, actually most of the people were quite optimistic. The officials were working all the way through that Salzburg up and down and we're making very good progress on many of the issues. Um, obviously, whatever happened in the German press and at dinner that night upset them so much they ended up with that bit of a bust-up on TV. But behind the scenes, the progress was being made. So we've been reassured that that, um, that, that is there. Um, so a unique trade agreement is the proposal between us, which is absolutely critical, which is, which is absolutely important. We have no tariffs and no customs barriers, no quotas on goods or any of that kind of uh, issue, and that would put us further ahead than any other trade deal that the EU has done. It's also worth recognising that we are constantly reminded that nobody else has ever tried to do this. This is in many ways a reverse free trade agreement. We are starting from a position of full alignment. In a free trade agreement, you're normally trying to get the two parties to align closer, and as they do, you reduce the tariff levels. That's the idea of a free trade agreement. In our case, we're starting from full alignment and it's about managing divergence. And nobody on the planet has ever done that before, which is why we're seeing quite a lot of ups and downs in doing it. Um, but the political agreement certainly is one that uh, was reached earlier in the year, and, and around the Chequers deal is really where they coalesced. Um, fast forward to where we are now six months later, we're in this last week before some pretty critical things 
have to happen around this. Not only that, though, the other thing that has to happen, once they've done all the heavy lifting in Brussels, and assuming we get to Wednesday, Thursday next week, and everyone's on, on, in a good place, of course, the next challenge for Theresa May's government is to get that through Parliament. And as you can see in the press, there was a lot, more, lot less optimism from Secretary of State this morning about the chances of actually getting this through Parliament. And there was a large, large plea for all of us, including the community here, to try to support the, uh, the government and try to encourage people to, to vote in the right direction and not have this split that's widely reported about people voting against the plan. Because the alternative of staring into the abyss with no deal is, is a serious one and something that uh, we are very, very concerned about. So that vulnerability of government is something that, uh, that um, I think will be probably more of an issue than actually agreeing where we are with the EU today, which I think is important. The key message that we keep repeating is that no deal is absolutely not an option for UK manufacturing. It really would be quite, quite difficult. As I said before, those uh, figures are quite stark. Um, the sense that we get is that uh, the larger businesses, as I said, have made their preparations. We have something like about 68% of smaller businesses that have made absolutely no preparations whatsoever and are really waiting to see the outcome of these before they do anything about deciding on rules of origin or customs and how they fill out customs forms. You imagine the scale of that. We have many companies that the only experience they've had for 40 years on exports is dealing with the EU. And there's no customs involved, there's no forms involved, there's no rules of origin calculations involved. So to get them to get to that position, that 150,000 businesses that are exclusively dealing in manufacturing with the EU is, uh, is quite a serious, serious um, challenge, we think. But standards are critical, and, and certainly criti one, one of the conversations we have with many of the companies is, is the importance of standards and the importance of our influence in standards, and that's the role that BSI certainly has been playing. There was a great recognition. I think there was a bit of confusion to start with inside of government about standards being part of the Brexit negotiations, and Scott and I certainly managed to convince Secretary of State to keep that separate because they're independent. Obviously, the standards bodies are independent from what's going on. Um, with the rest of Brussels, and we, I think, achieved quite a good result there in the UK government committing to the international standards system and enabling us to, to move forward with changing the criteria for membership of those bodies in Europe, particularly around critical ones like Sen and Senelec, which, um, for the, uh, if you look at the UK manufacturing statistics at the moment, electronics is absolutely the key part of our growth at the moment, so making sure we're ma maintaining our position there is absolutely critical. And, of course, for manufacturers, there's many benefits of this standardisation process, not least the, the fact that we are able to influence them, but in fact it keeps business um, in the right place economically in terms of building to the right standards. And of course, the promotion of that internationally is absolutely critical. The, uh, a single standard being adopted internationally still remains the goal of most people. If you talk to manufacturers, they support that unanimously. And I think we have the government in the right place with that now going forwards, which is good. So whatever this new partnership looks like with the EU, Maintaining our position on those standards bodies is seen as absolutely critical and I think we have the support of government going forwards to make sure that that happens. Leaving the EU should not be an opportunity to reverse that position. That's the key message that we've been giving to them. Particularly as we go through international trade deals because I can tell you in some of those negotiations that some of the other countries are trying to push hard their standards um, system on the UK as part of those trade deals and our um, strong advice to government is to resist any of that, even to resist watering down where we are with standards to make sure that that, that does not happen. It's absolutely critical that we don't uh, try to um, negotiate away our standards position for the sake of a trade deal, particularly with the United States I think is where, where most of that is coming from. So the other message that we've got, of course, is that business needs to remain closely involved in these negotiations. All of these angles are very complex, from the standards to where we are with, with customs and borders. And our job is weekly to make sure those implications of any decisions they give away in these negotiations are fully understood in government and the impact on the sector is clearly, clearly recognised. Um, there is, we've, won most, we've won lots of the battles. We've lost some with government. I think we had quite a push before Chequers on making sure services was included, and of course services was excluded in the end, so we lost that battle. The reason we took that up is that if you think about capital goods, most of them are sold as a financial package nowadays, 
Um, GE is more of a bank than it is a manufacturer. BMW cars are more of a financial institution than they are a car manufacturer. And so for them, the, the separation of those two issues in the negotiations seemed quite difficult to, to understand. And so we tried to push hard on that one, but the financial community won the battle there on keeping out of the regulatory framework. So we have this kind of odd situation where we're talking about manufactured goods and not talking about services in, in, in the same way. So we continue to represent very, very seriously the position in, uh, for the manufacturing sector in government. And uh, of course for us, we are looking forward to what this new relationship will be so that we can build the right levels of support for all the manufacturing members that we have and the larger community of manufacturing in, in, in the country. That's kind of a summary. I mean, the other thing is, if you go on the EF website, you'll see loads of tools and we've got lots of people working on Brexit. I mean, there's lots of advice. So if any of you got any questions at all or are unsure about any of the aspects of the detail of where we are with Brexit and manufacturing, then um, we're here to help and provide the right advice. Scott, thank you very much thank you. for your time. Thank you. Do you want me to um, ask some questions? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. sure yeah. News there. <laughs> a privilege the to have received, yes. <laughs> received some breaking news. So Stephen's kindly agreed to take a few questions. Uh, so if we have some questions, we'll take them in groups of two just for ease. We've got uh, microphones uh, in various places. Uh, one there, for example. Anybody want to go first with a question to Stephen about what he's heard this morning about, or about what your fears are or, or, or your concern? We have one question here. Anyone else? Maybe one on this side just for ease of uh, moving the microphones around. Well, let's take this question first. You might like to say who you are as well. John Park. I'm down as Canadian Lumber Standards Accreditation Board. It's one of the bodies I work alongside of. My understanding is that there was never any doubt that we would continue to be part of the standards development process because SEN is not a European Union body. The one that we would lose our seat on if we were not a club member would be the Standing Committee on Construction, where they have the arguments to iron out issues that become a problem when it can't be agreed on what has actually been included in the standards. What will be the situation? And also, the second part of the question is, when we become a third country, what will be our notifying body status? Mm. Mm. Will, we be, will we have to have one system for the UK and one system for Europe as far as notified bodies goes? Thank you. Okay, so two well, I, well, Scott can probably answer the more detailed question in terms of the construction. Let me answer the first point, though, just, just to make a comment. I mean, you said um, about there was, kind of a, we were, there was never any doubt about being part of those committees because they weren't part of it. I think, actually, the gov we weren't in that, quite in that place earlier in the year. The government was quite convinced that this was part of negotiations to start with, and we had to do quite a lot of work to make sure there was that separation. And of course, the eligibility criteria to be members of those bodies was being part of the EU or the wider EFTA community. And uh, part of the role was that they needed a commitment from the UK government to make sure we stay as part of the international standards um, process to, in, or, in order for them to change the eligibility criteria. And, and that we actually got them to do, which I thought was really, really important step. So, so don't assume that the government knows all the details of these things, they don't. Secondly, there's an awful lot yet to work out in terms of a lot of those communities, I, I would say. Um, we have a lot of questions about everything from air safety to where we are with um, food standards and everything else, which are yet to be done at the regulatory level. So there's a lot more to do. And they don't have all the answers yet by any stretch of the imagination. But you might want to say something about Richard, do you want to say something about the Standing Committee on Construction, maybe? Well, I'm sure it's on. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, so in terms of uh, we, what we're talking about here is the European Committee for Standardisation, European mm. Committee for Electrotechnical Standardisation, and Standing Committee on Construction. They may sound like they're all the, all the same thing, but in fact, of course, it's, it's very different. So the, the standardisation bodies are member associations owned by their members and standards bodies. They're not uh, EU bodies, whereas the Standing Committee on Construction as with uh, all the other new approach directives, they are committees of the EU uh, populated by, by member states and performing a regulatory function. So it's quite a, it's quite a different thing to be the involvement in the Standing Committee on Instruction as opposed to being involved in, in Senate and Senate Lake. So the Senate and Senate Lake part is the bit that, that we're talking about. Involvement in the Standing Committee on Construction and indeed all the similar yeah. committees, LVD, Working Party and so on, 
That's down to uh, the question of negotiation between the UK and the EU because it's, it's a purely... And we still don't know the answer to that yet. To no, which we don't know the answer, yeah. no. <coughs> but you're right that that is an area where there's a challenge. A question here as well. Maybe, Richard, we could just borrow your microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jack Semples. My name is Engineering and Machinery Alliance. Uh, I wondered if there's a view as to standards which are uh, in emerging technologies. So autonomous vehicles would be one obvious example. I wondered if there's a view agreed in government as to what our position should be there or if there's even a direction of travel. Well, what the, the broad thrust is that there is quite an appetite for us to main, remain at the forefront of that. I mean, in some areas we are falling behind. Um, EV is one of them, but the other one I can tell you where there's a lot of work is on what we're doing with I4 and around automation and AI standards in particular going forwards. Um, we are in some areas leading the charge in terms of things like health and safety for robotics. That's quite an important push at the moment with manufacturing, where we're doing most of the heavy lifting in the European committees on that. But there is a real intention that we remain at the forefront of that. And you might want to add some colour to it. I don't know if that's something you want to do. Yeah. Thank you. It's a simple question, actually. But you're there, you're there in the emerging technologies at, at the sharp end of international standards work. So, yes, there is activity within the European sphere, but actually a lot of that we do <coughs> directly or bilaterally, um, driving in support for UK manufacturers, innovators, the academic community. Uh, I was talking only yesterday on AI in railway infrastructure, for example, big data applications. So we will drive that as we do mm -hmm. today, uh, just uh, led by the market, led by the innovators, uh, that community. Some of it flows through into the European space, if we have a European appetite for that. But our policy always is international first. The question is, are there enough international company, countries for us to gather yeah. a, uh, a, um, a group together and push that straight into the international space? So it's all about a strategy for emerging technologies. How fast do the innovators want to get to what position? And then what are the standards tools that we can use to help them deliver that competitive advantage? Some of those may be European, but they're more likely to be international and, and possibly unilateral. We just do it ourselves. That's the key to this. Yeah. Any final observations for Stephen? We have one right at the back. Mike's got the microphone. It's on its way. Any, any, anyone else want to get one last point pointed to Stephen before we move on? Okay. Hello, I, I'm Dan Gibson, uh, Product Access Certification and Notified Body. And the question I would like to ask is, has there any consideration been given to a CE mark? Um, will there be any alignment with it? Uh, will the UK propose its own? Uh, how we're going to interface and who's going to have a final say in a trade dispute, the ECG or the UK courts? That's definitely one for you, Scott. CE I mean, marking yeah, and yeah. possible well, UK mark. I'm say, Stephen, it's not one for us, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, CE mark, as we all know, in this room is a regulatory uh, yes, a mark. Regulatory. It's yes. not a standards mark. Um, the announcement on government sites last week and the conversations we were having last week is that there will be recognition for a CE mark uh, post-March 2019 for some period, but that will be time limited. But uh, uh, there will be a UK mark, we are told, which will be available from next year. So, the, so the Bayes is working hard at that moment. So we've seen the original, they've come up with the sort of initial designs of the British version of a CE mark, with, and they're trying to get equivalents with the CE regulatory yeah. position is the idea of it, yeah. yeah. So, so there's no doubt that's going to cause additional uh, uh, impact yeah, on British manufacturers. Yeah. And, and if there's recognition of CE yeah. mark in the UK, but there isn't a UK mark in Europe for some period, there's going to be a... Uh, dislocation there as well. However, some form of UK mark, we are told, is going to be available for UK manufacturers to use. There will then be questions about how that is to be assessed through the notified body structure uh, as we have today, because UK notified bodies today uh, will become, well, sorry, notified bodies today will become UK notified bodies uh, if they are UCAS accredited from March 2019. So that system will, will flow on, but we do envisage, uh, we have been told, there will be a UK mark. I think these questions illustrate a really important point, is that, is that is, is the issue why the larger companies have really gone hard on their plan Bs at the moment. There is no clarity on these points. That level of detail has not been taught. We are two years in through the process now, and we are still at the point of just agreeing the transition for 18 months. That's where we are. All this other stuff, we are miles away from that. There's the, the thing we will see, most likely, at the end of uh, this initial process will be a withdrawal agreement, which is a standstill for until December 2020, 
to keep everything the same whilst we negotiate a future economic partnership, and really what is a heads of terms which will have chapter headings on it about all the things that we need to agree. Mm. That's all we're going to see. I mean, despite the press saying there's going to be a Brexit deal in two weeks, there is not going to be a Brexit deal in two weeks. There will be a withdrawal agreement to keep us in the same status quo until December 2020, and there will be the beginning of a negotiation on all of these issues. So that's, that's where we are after two years, and it's quite concerning for many mm. manufacturers. So Stephen, the EF does a great job of encapsulating the hopes and fears of your members and mm. putting them to government. Are you more optimistic this afternoon than you were when you got up this morning? Well, I was, heard this, morning I was, uh, this morning I was very optimistic, actually, because I thought we're making good progress. We're going to get to a withdrawal agreement. That, everyone will see that as a good step forward. Um, but Greg sort of dampened that enthusiasm today by saying, yes, we might do that, but Parliament might well be the tricky bit. And that's the thing we will have to work hard on to try and encourage as many people to support whatever they agree as possible. So. A job for all of us. Will you join yeah. me in thanking Stephen Thank Phipson. you. Thank you, Stephen. So hopefully that hasn't uh, depressed you too much with the update from government. I think that's, uh, it's excellent to get that insight and to understand where the challenges are. Um, I'd now like to welcome Scott. You've, you've met him, heard from him already. Scott Stephen is BSI's Director of Standards to give the standards response. Thank you very much. And that conversation has already just opened up uh, the door on the detail. And I hope that today in this event we can go uh, one step beyond the, the discussions that we were having last year. Thank you very much, Stephen. It's always a real pleasure to hear from you. And I'm really grateful that you uh, popped down here from, from the Secretary of State to give us that update. Particular thanks also to the EEF. Their continued support for our position has been uh, really, really valuable. I mean, great friend and ally uh, to us and, and fantastic that cooperation that you've been uh, showing. So really grateful for that commitment to the understanding of the role of standards and the value of, of the work of everybody uh, in this room, in this area. So I'm going to remind you about our position on Brexit, why it's so important. And I'm then going to bring you up to speed this morning with the latest developments and try and talk a little bit about where we go from here, uh, trade agreements and that sort of thing. But so I'm sure you're all familiar that um, after the referendum, indeed, uh, Kirsty, straight after the referendum, uh, BSI had a lot of conversations with our stakeholders, with committee members, subscribing members uh, across industry, and we've got very, very clear messages, and Stephen has um, uh, summarised those this morning. So, post-Brexit, BSI will continue to provide that standards development publishing framework that all our stakeholders need for them to access uh, markets around the world, uh, whatever those conditions, nationally, Europe and globally. In other, words, in other words, as we said to the Secretary of State, we need to do our job as the UK's national standards body, including continuing our memberships of the European and international standards organisations. So why is, why is that so important? It's important because business, industry, consumers have told us that they want the right standards delivered in the right way to help do their work, to simplify decisions, to enable the better specifying of services and products, and in this regard, non-regulated services. It is very straightforward to separate services. There are services that are regulated and services that are not regulated or regulated in a different way. They can be separated. To enable quality, to accelerate innovation, to your question earlier, to drive down barriers to international trade. So, Critically, business in the UK wants to influence the content of those standards. They want to do the job themselves, they want to do it in the way that brings them the maximum benefit, and fundamentally, they want to do it once. Other stakeholders have exactly the same concerns. So our consumers very much want, and with their very limited resources, need to work in only one standards developing process. They can't afford to work in multiple standards developing processes, influencing standards from all over the world. They want one channel leading to a very clear and, and uh, coherent uh, uh, standards framework. They want to have the maximum impact on standards that underpin quality and safety and that build trust in business transactions wherever in the world uh, we choose to purchase, either as individuals or as companies. So what does it say about our standards system? It says we have the right system. We base our national catalogue of standards on a framework of one standard for any given aspect of a product, process or service, developed at the international level wherever possible and adopted is as a national standard in the UK. You can use any standard you like in the UK, but if you choose to use a national standard, 
you'll find there's only one of them on that given topic. Adopted means that we will make it a British standard, we'll put BS on the front cover. So our stakeholders influence the content of that standard through national delegations participating in its development. And I'm really going to spend time this morning unpicking what that means. When you add that to the European regional standards, which are themselves international wherever possible, they are adopted identically as national standards in all member countries and all conflicting standards are withdrawn, we oversee a catalogue of about 37,000 British standards. That's the sort of number that a developed economy with the global impact of the UK needs to sustain itself. The majority of those are international, developed now in, in, a, in an international system, a process where our stakeholders have, frankly, enormous influence today. It's an international catalogue. Our national standards are no longer as they were in the 1950s. They are now international in character. Only about 15% of them are UK only. That percentage is diminishing year on year. So I would say that the national catalogue is coherent and non-conflicting. And the stakeholder community represented here today are a key part of that. That system promotes market access worldwide and it drives down barriers to trade. Our system enables our stakeholders to show international leadership and influence in the content of the standards. Significant UK soft power. Talking yesterday to the MPEG community on genomics, very keen to assert leadership globally in that space. Our system, therefore, is the right one for our stakeholders and it's designed to meet their needs. Indeed, it's been developed by them and for them. And it's endorsed, as Stephen said, by government. So my second major point concerns regulation. As we see regularly in our conversations with government, the instances where standards are used to support regulatory policy are relatively few, but very important. They're seen at a very high profile in the media. This includes enabling the UK to meet the requirements of the WTO Technical Barriers to Trade Agreement. Only around 10% of our national standards collection are linked to regulation. That's a small proportion of the regional standards in the collection. Why in these cases, this 10%, do we argue that governments should not recognise other standards alongside national standards as an alternative means of supporting regulatory compliance. It's because our national standards derive from a mature system with independent and robust governance that provides for open and transparent participation of all UK stakeholder groups. It's a bottom-up process involving stakeholders, consumers, industry, regulators, academics, experts in a neutral and independent governance resulting in a single standard where everybody who is affected by that standard has a chance to participate in it. It's a system that our stakeholders want and over which they have control, government, society, industry, together. So the proposition here is that if government makes available different, potentially competing standards for compliance purposes, then the role of industry and consumers is diminished. Civil servants will make the decisions and British standards will be devalued. Government alone would choose the standards used nationally with regulation, not the standards that UK businesses use in their work, not the standards that consumers affected by those uh, uh, requirements, levels of safety have influenced. So for UK stakeholders, it would also mean abandoning UK involvement in the development of the European regional standards as we'd no longer be able to meet those commitments, no longer be able to guarantee that the British standard, the BS, is the only national standard in the catalogue. It would mean the UK government, industry and consumers losing control of the international leadership position we have and becoming a taker of other people's standards developed from anywhere in the world by anybody. So just remember there's a world of difference between using a standard and shaping the content of that standard. Remember that 57% of our British standards catalogue comes through European processes in this cooperative mechanism that we've described. It's the influence that our stakeholders have over European standards 
that's the critical point. So rather than an ideology, I would say the single national standard model is a practical system that involves UK stakeholders in an international process where their needs, your needs, are met globally and regionally. As UK stakeholders are among the most active, indeed they are the most active in ISO, of any country in the world. So our views are reflected in the standards that are used globally as well. For those of you who want statistics, it's 95% of ISO committees that include UK stakeholder representation. That's more than any other country in the world, including Germany. So let's just unpick the piece about regulation just one step further on. The system that we use in the UK is called co-regulation. It's a co-regulatory model based on performance regulation by and large. Not in high-risk areas, but in the vast majority of goods and services, it's a performance-based system. This is used in all other European countries. It's a modern technology, a modern approach to the use of standards and regulation, bottom-up, nudge. Industries are encouraged to do things using voluntary best practice. So in this model, the government trusts standards developing stakeholders through the BSI governance process that we bring to you to deliver good practice that's sufficient to meet the requirements of the law. Technical regulation is minimised. So that's regulation written by government is minimised in this system. It's a bottom-up process. The model meets regulatory needs at the same time keeping administrative burdens on industry to a minimum. Bottom-up, as we say, pro-competitive, as others say, stakeholder-led, market-driven. If there are requests from government, we talk about that word in the European context, a request to Sen and Senelec for standards, industry responds to a scope of work, just as happens in Canada, Australia, and indeed in the US when government can't find something on the shelf, they will make a request to their standards bodies to offer some support. So it's a request coming from governments to support the re delivery of regulatory policy. It's a bottom-up process. So our model promotes global threat trade through linking through to international standards. Approaching 45% of European standards actually are identical uh, or based on international standards already. And the remaining European standards are additional to not replacing international standards. It is not a black and white alternative European standards that are not ISO and IEC are additional to the international standards uh, uh, as well. This, so this model, we would argue, supports innovation because it permits flexibility in terms of compliance. Manufacturers have other routes to demonstrate compliance with a standard. They have alternative paths in the UK. They may choose to use the national standard or they may choose to use any other standard as long as they meet the law that law being a performance requirement. So the co-regulatory model is more flexible and innovation friendly than prescriptive regulation. Those of us who are old enough to remember prescriptive regulation would, would feel comfortable with that statement. It's more flexible than the US model, which is based on a very old school prescriptive structure, both at federal and at state level. Government bodies there will select standards or bits of standards and paste them into the regulation making compliance mandatory. That's an old school system that, that uh, makes it very difficult for manufacturers to drive innovation. There are many standards in the market in the US, but when it comes to regulation, there are no alternatives to using the standards that are incorporated by reference or IBR in the law. There's no coherent set of national standards in the US. They're all private interest standards developed by people and experts all over the world. They're very, very useful. They're used all over the world, but they don't have the same governance attributes that I've been describing for the international system. So the third important subject I want to cover is the nature of the international system itself. We stress the importance of international standards for stray, trade, but there are different opinions as to what constitutes an international standard. And I'm keen that we all have a, an understanding of that this morning because it's been high in, in the media and you may well hear about it in the weeks to come. We recognise standards from ISO and IEC, the global organisations, as international standards, I'm going to say capital I, including those from official organisations like the ITU, the Telecommunications Union, Codex Elementaris, the UNEC and so on. 
Our view is that to be true international standards, they must have a certain legitimacy. Part of this legitimacy comes from robust governance, and the rest hinges on the representation of national interests in their development. So organisations such as BSI and our, our opposite numbers around the world are appointed by their governments to maintain their national catalogues, developing national standards that enable market access within the country and support their regulatory frameworks, all about mutual market access. So as an example, in the IEC, the International Electric Technical Commission, an important global organisation, any country desiring to be a member shall form a national committee. Did you hear me say any country desiring to be a member shall form a national committee? It's the country that's the member, not an unknown private enterprise. So it's only by combining this national representation with that of other countries that an international standard can truly be considered international capital I. Not international used everywhere, that's fine, that's great, but when you want to have a national catalogue of standards in China or, or, or India or, or Germany or the UK or Canada or Australia or Japan, you need a coherent set that includes national representation on which government can draw to use in support of policy. So when we're talking about standards being used for market access conditions, public safety and environmental protection, that 10% of the catalogue, our position as the UK's national standards body is they can only be delivered by international bodies that are representative of national interests, not by a random mixture of private company interests from any old country around the world. It's not enough to say that stakeholders from anywhere can take part and therefore a standard is international. This creates a standard developed internationally, not an international standard that you can use for public policy purposes. So if that's the context of our Brexit position, where are we now? Well, in relation to our continued membership of the European and international standards organisations, the only aspect of concern, as Stephen has said, is membership of SEN and Senelec. Here, the eligibility clauses of the statutes and the regulations do not recognise the situation that the UK will find itself in. So there's a vacuum or a void. And the risk to that is not that I'm going to resign the UK membership, but that there's a challenge. Standards work is all about challenge. So if there's any uncertainty about why UK experts are in that committee, or a UK chairman or a secretariat has made a decision, there could be a challenge, and that uncertainty we must avoid. And that argument is well accepted by the Sen and Senelec members because it would lead to an instability in that system, that system being the most developed form of the international system. So it's our job with the other members to resolve that as quickly and cleanly as possible and deliver a system that reflects the needs of all our stakeholders. So we've been working with those three strands, our stakeholders here in the UK, with government separately, and with our fellow Sen and Senelec members, both in, in the formal structures of governance and individually on bilateral basis. Been in constant touch with, with them, our newsletter updates, events like this, the webinars, and, and the bilateral meetings that we've quietly been having around Europe just to make sure we understand their position, how their governments are interfacing with their standards bodies, what their industry view is, and so on. And we get a very, very consistent picture from across all those countries that they want this fixed. They don't want the UK to exit the uh, international, the regional standard system in Sen Senelec. They want us to be part of that because we are a major part of that system. So it's been clear that we needed a level of commitment from the UK government because whatever I say, what does Greg Clark say? And in terms of the role of standards, they, they link to regulation and the national framework as I've described. What is the UK government's position on that post-March 2019? We've put secondments into BAYS, into DIT, into DEX-EU, and we work very closely, as close as we possibly can get access to the civil servants and ministers in, in those departments to just to educate and advise them about this, this rather unknown part of the economy. We wrote to Greg Clark twice this year with Stephen's support. He wrote back to us with a very clear message, which was that they would su support in our policy position he understood the role of standards in the economy, the independence of the national standards body, and that the regulatory model 
of showing conformity with high-level essential requirements, which will, to your question earlier, become UK essential requirements post-March 2019, uh, uh, were supported. I took that letter with me when I met with the boards of Sen and Senelec in June, uh, uh, putting our case to them, and they agreed a resolution that would work towards finding uh, an approach for the UK to uh, stay, continue as a member of Sen and Senelec without the risk of challenge that I've been described, as long as we continue to follow the rules, just as you would with membership of any membership association. So we've been working with our fellow members to bring clarity to that situation, seeking always to separate the technical from the political. Remember, we're involved in developing stakeholder-led standards for business use. We're not involved in developing technical regulation. We are not regulators. I'm not a policeman. I'm a facilitator to help you get the standards you need. So our meeting in June was, was very successful. I was pleased with the outcome of that. A Brexit working group was formed in Sen and Senelec, and we understand that that group has accepted the separation of our case from the political uh, argument. We don't need to wait for a political outcome to make a decision on the standard system because it's a stakeholder-driven, bottom-up process. That group has acknowledged the commitment of our stakeholders to con continuing to meet the rules of Sen and Senelec, my commitment as BSI to that process. It's recognised the UK government policy so far as it's been elaborated in the Prime Minister's speech, in the, in the White Paper, in the letter from the Secretary of State. And those discussions were continuing last week in Brussels. I met um, with them. I've also met with the Commission separately to discuss it. And we believe that we expect proposals in the next two to three weeks for decisions at the boards and the General Assemblies of Sen and Senelec in November. Uh, I'm quietly confident that will just be uh, a, a fairly straightforward matter. So it's a very positive message I can bring you this morning. We're very confident that we're going to get what we're looking for that you wanted us to achieve in the BSI position. So we're confident we're on a good track in, in the Brexit work in Sen and Senelec, but it can't be complacent and the, it, the work really can start now. I think Stephen's just really highlighted that, especially in relation to future trade agreements. We will be negotiating from a position of huge strength in relation to our standard system. It's really important, I can't underestimate how important that is to realise the strength of our position in negotiating free trade agreements with, with any country around the world. This country, UK, BSI as your member, is respected globally for our influence on international business standards. We are coming at that negotiation from a massive position of strength. And we mustn't throw away our global leadership in that domain. We mustn't acquiesce to pressure that is really designed to suit other countries uh, uh, exporting more to us. We need to keep the pressure up on all fronts, and I need your support in that. You need to push this message in your discussions with government from your sector, <coughs> your association, wherever it's from. <clears throat> it's also a perfect time to contact and reinforce your support with the European federations. They've been very helpful at just encouraging and reminding Sen and Senelec member countries that they're behind this. The Security Industry Federation, Business Europe have directly contributed and more input would be really valuable. I've got a final request this morning, which is please be really accurate in the terminology that you use. We are here to help. My email is, is open. I read all my emails, by the way. And if not, Richard will answer you. But we need to really help you get the terminology right. In the weeks that come ahead, this word standards will be tossed around all over the place. And let's be really accurate if you're trying to get a message across uh, to, to anybody as to what you mean. So for example, in, even in the white paper uh, published uh, after the Chequers meeting, uh, uh, government describe European standards as EU standards. Very unhelpful, at least one of our stakeholders uh, repeated that. So the European standards that we work on are adopted within EU and other countries, but there's no such thing as an EU standard. This is not a top-down political process. It's a multi-stakeholder process, as I've described, through national delegations broader than the EU geographically and aligned with international processes in ISO and IEC. So we want to maximise the opportunity that our strength in standards brings to the UK post-Brexit, and we want to minimise the risk of politicisation in trade negotiations 
or in the, in the uh, withdrawal arrangements. We've got overwhelming support for our Brexit position. UK government policy clearly supports that. There are very positive developments within Sen and Senelec. We need to keep the pressure up, but now we need to look to the future. We see standards as the oil that drives the engine of trade, and we're going to continue to work as closely as we can with DIT, with FCO, on the Belt and Road, in Asia, uh, to see what we can do to open up opportunities from our position of strength. We see BSI as your national standards body, supporting the implementation of standards, not just producing them, but helping you develop those strategies for innovation uh, and accelerated growth. We want to protect your influence in that system. So the next session this morning that we're about to get into is really important for us as much as for you. We need to listen. I look forward to that panel discussion very much. We need to hear from you how best we can support your interests, whether your government, whether your society, or whether your industry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Scott, and we'll come on to those questions about the future and about the trade agreements and how standards can support them during the panel discussion, but um, this is an opportunity just to ask Scott a few questions about where we are in the standards world uh, with regard to the uh, changes that are taking place. So some microphones are, are quickly on their way, so we actually see lots of uh, hands up. So we, we'll probably take two over here. Well, hold on, the microphone's going there first. Um, but maybe, Richard, we could have the microphone uh, to somebody at the front. We, we don't, won't miss your questions as well. Um, so, shall we go first? Would you like to introduce yourself, Anne? Uh, yeah. Anne Ferguson from the BSI Consumer and Public Interest Network. I know it's a sort of aside from, from, from everything else, but um, within the European Standards Committees, as well as the uh, consumer representatives, which might go up through the national standards bodies, or as we do from BSI, there is ANEC, which is European Voice of Consumers and Standardisation, and a lot of ANEC reps are actually from their UK nationals, but ANIC is funded by the EC and EFTA, I believe. I just wondered whether BSI has any insight as to what will be happening there and whether UK reps will continue to be working in that consumer environment. Yeah. It's a sure. good question. It's let's, an, shall we take a couple of questions yes, and then we'll come to come and answer them? We, we won't lose it, but let's, let's see how many more we can get. I think we need a Thanks, microphone Anne. over there, Mike, and a question at the front. Um, yeah, I'm uh, Julian Hubbard, I'm a safety consultant. Um, <clears throat> in the past, uh, when European directives have come out and there weren't supporting standards, because I fully agree with you that you don't want to embed a lot of uh, prescriptive detail in those, um, <clears throat> there would normally be a mandate issued on SEN or SENELEC to produce those standards. And I just wondered how that would fit in with the UK not being part of the EU and the, uh, the single market, but being part of SEN Senelec. Okay, so let's, we'll take one more question and then uh, we'll, we'll uh, try and answer these three together. I see your question in a second, Roy. Um, Glyn Evans, Olive Group. I have a background in government dealing with the European Union and coming to the world of standards, the educational gap I found absolutely enormous and I can quite see why you've been lobbying very widely to get government officials to understand precisely what is involved. How effective do you think your counterparts in Sen and Senelec are being with their own governments? Because a process of inertia on highly technical issues among European partners is extremely high across the board. Are you certain that the Commission, if it, probably what they'll do is go with whatever the Commission says. Um, and are you absolutely confident that that is going ahead as smoothly as you would wish? Thank you. Excellent. So um, I'll take those three in order. So Anne and Arnold, you're looking to, to speak, if you could. Um, I'm going to ask Richard to answer the ANEC question. So this is about ANEC being a very important European Consumer Association. How it will be funded and the UK's involvement in that? Thank you, Scott. Yes. Um, We've, we've had several discussions with ANIC about their, their, their position and uh, their financing. And we have made the, 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 when in our discussions with the Department of Business here, we've spoken to them also about, about ANIC funding. Um, obviously, there are a lot, there are a lot of uh, UK experts working in ANIC. They're not representing the UK. They are from the UK. And so it's not quite the same as, mm. as coming through a national delegation within, 
within BSI. Um, from from my, my side, I would be really interested to see a positive response to ANIC to the BSI position because, of course, there's not much point in having a load of UK experts working in European standards if, if, uh, if the yeah. UK is no longer involved in Standard and Standard Lake itself. And so a more positive statement from ANIC would be very, would be very helpful from the, from the BSI side. But nevertheless, we, we do support ANIC's work right across the board. We support it and try to link ever better between our own consumer public interest network and the work that's done through ANEC. Okay, thanks. Yes, could I perhaps add, I'm Arnold Pinder, um, president of ANEC and uh, the UK representative on the um, General Assembly, which means I represent all um, UK consumer organisations, which Citizens Advice, etc. Um, and uh, just recently, we put in questions through the House of Lords to government on uh, the future representation of, uh, through ANEC uh, to get a, an answer which says they haven't thought about it, really, yes. <laughs> that we're doing things, we, we're interested. Um, and so it really is one an example of the myriad of yeah. small details yeah. that have got to yeah. be dealt with. Yeah. I'd love to talk to you perhaps okay. about uh, some contingency Okay. Um, because, I mean, for trade associations, no doubt you can find ways of working with your trade associations in Europe because that's going to be of interest, particularly the interface between legislation and standards in the European yeah. context. Okay. We, still want to, um, we still want to influence things from the consumer perspective from UK, and we need to work on it, but right. uh, that's enough, I think. All right, that, thank you, Arnold. So that very nice, this extraordinary word, segue, segue to, to your question. Um, this question now is about... The, the fact that the European Union, through the Commission, requests of the standards community over the fence, invites the community, unfortunate word mandate, but actually it's an invitation to industry, would they like to respond by developing a standard to support a future regulatory policy, maybe environmental protection, for example, that is coming down the pipe? Now, UK, along with other countries currently outside the EU in future uh, are all part of that process. So members of Sen and Senelec are equal members. If they are full members of Sen and Senelec, it doesn't matter whether they're an accession country like Turkey or an EFTA country or an EU country or, uh, I'll say quietly optimistically, UK. Everybody's in that room together because the Commission, the civil servants, are looking for industry and stakeholder-led standards to support a regulatory policy. So the question of legitimacy comes to, to bear. And this question has been asked of us. People say, so Scott, why would you be in the room helping to write a standard that's going to be used by the EU when we can't be sure that your government's going to use the same sort of regulatory requirement in future? We can't be sure of that. And, and you say, well, listen, um, don't forget, a lot of the European standards used to support European regulation are international anyway. I mean, they were written in the IEC by Japan and Ethiopia and, and South Africa, and then they're used to support regulatory delivery in the EU and currently in the UK to meet the performance requirements. So the legitimacy argument falls away quite quickly when you recognise that this is not about writing technical regulation where you would say, why are you in the room writing technical regulation? You're not a member of the EU. It's about writing voluntary standards. And then you want the widest possible national representation of stakeholder involvement to get the best possible, I said it multiple times, bottom-up standard to support that regulation. That's the co-regulatory model. So, of course, you want people in the room. And we have people, and we're open to anybody participating in our committees. You don't have to be a British national to participate through the UK delegation. Companies can do that. So the legitimacy argument falls away when you think about the standard in its true role, which is to provide the industry response to a request. And we would imagine, I mentioned Canada, that's exactly what happens today, Canadian government invite the community to prepare a standard to support a regulatory policy, and that community then responds with a proposal saying, well, we think you could do it this way, and then they say, okay, or they, or they revise the scope. So this is all about the relationship between government and the industry and stakeholder community and how they see the use of standards supporting regulatory delivery. But that's not, not something really, we, you know, we can, you can see that it falls away as an argument, provided you don't end up in the world of technical regulation. And then you can't ask people to write your technical regulation. And to your super question about other countries, um, 
yes, we talk closely to, to a whole range of other countries. I could, I could name them, but you, you, you could recognize who they all would be. Um, they have all had their national governments visiting their standards body and their director standards saying, what are you going to do about BSI? What do you recommend? So both industry and governments have engaged with them. I have to say that in most countries, the major countries in the European uh, um, orbit, uh, um, uh, they really do understand standards. I mean, Germany has a hundred years of culture that standards drive industry and competitive advantage. My opposite number in Berlin said to me some couple of years ago, a few years ago, he said, I don't understand the problem with British industry. He said, in Germany, industry beats a path to my door with their checkbook open to write the international standard because they know it's going to bring them international advantage. Why don't they do this in Britain? And I said, well, because they don't know about it. But in Germany, they know about it. In France, they know about it. In Spain, they know about it. So I don't have an issue there that the governments know what's going on in, in all the leading European countries, in the smaller European countries in the Sen and Senelec membership, which include some, some you know, very small countries, uh, um, they, will, they will go along. But what they don't want, actually, is UK to disappear because the, the, the balance and weight of UK, France, Germany in the Sen and Senelec system is extremely important to the overall coherence. So I'm confident that most of our education needs to be directed here in the UK and where we have had to do it in some countries, I've offered to meet their ministers and I've certainly met the Commission and everybody's quietly comfortable. Well, we're going to take the last set of questions before we move on to the panel. There was a question here. There's a question here as well, Richard. Let's take these, these three and then we... Um, you're next. Okay. Hello, uh, Chris Clear from the Mineral Products Association. So I'm involved in the standardisation of concrete and concrete products. And there's been, a, there's been a number of issues which have been going on, which I think might even be separate from Brexit. But we have harmonised standards consultants who are coming in and are giving instructions on how standards should be written. And I keep saying, this doesn't make sense, this isn't sensible, and yet it's very hard to get other people involved to say, no, no, you know, this should be a stakeholder thing. You know, the, the industry should write the standards in agreement. Um, but I feel I'm a bit lost, because all the information I get about what harmonised standards consultants are doing is coming to me second hand, and I, I, it doesn't seem to be very much help or explanation or guidance I'm getting uh, from anyone at the moment, Great including question. BSI. Great okay, question. Let's come. We will pick that up, Chris. Your question, you. and then just in front. Yes. A question about the harmonised standards, which has been the subject of discussion for a few minutes already. Yes. Yeah, please. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, I chair one of the railway BSI committees. Now, a harmonised standard is, if, sorry, compliance with a harmonised standard is deemed to mean that you're complying with the relevant European directives, as I understand yeah. it. Um, when those Euronorms, like any other Euronorm, are, are issued by SEN, they become British standards. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd like to just quote the opening sentence from a typical harmonised standard. It says, this European standard was prepared to meet the essential requirements of EU directives. Once it becomes a BS, it's really saying this British standard was prepared to meet the essential requirements of yeah. European directives. Now, are the more fanatical leavers among us aware that there might be a little bit of an anomaly here, that uh, once the, that particular or any harmonised euro norm is activated or called up in a contract within Britain, uh, it's effectively bringing European law to bear? Okay, I'll okay. answer that question. Let's go that one. Why? Thank you. <coughs> Um, Roy Irani, Gas Packet Solutions. Um, I chair a committee at BSI which is largely populated by members of the British Compressed Gas Association. Mm. Uh, in 1999, a directive came into force which has been of tremendous help to the British industry. Um, it's the Transportable Pressure Equipment Directive mm. where we rely on something called a pie mark mm. which allows a free movement of 
gas cylinder products contain mm. throughout the EU. Mm. You mentioned uh, some comments about the um, CE marking going yeah. out of fashion in a year's time. Will the same apply to other regulatory marks as well, Scott? Yes, okay. Right. Well, well, we, we know a little bit about that, but not much more than I said earlier. It's one of the areas that Stephen mentioned that is still really to be worked out. So um, let me start with the, the uh, uh, consultants. So I talked earlier about the way this works. Um, the community, through Sen and Senelec, are invited to develop standards or to offer a standard. And the first thing they do, by the way, is look to see if there's an international standard that will do the job. They don't automatically rush off and write a standard. There might already be existing international work happening that would serve that purpose, and we can repurpose it or use it directly to support the, uh, the, the regulatory uh, requirement. Um, but then, of course, just as you'd expect, uh, that standard is prepared, uh, it, it's offered to the Commission, and the Commission then invites, or they, they, they pay, consultants to have a little dialogue about whether that really is going to meet the regulatory requirement or not. And that's been a source of some contention in the last few years. Uh, it, it's frankly a back office issue that we, BSI, and our uh, uh, other members of Sensenelec are very concerned about. Uh, and there's been a stockpile of standards in some sectors, worse than others, construction being, being one of those. So it is a process that's uh, being worked on today. I think the construction products area is one of the trickier areas where the backlog is still large and the process being worked out. I'd love to suggest that, that we take this offline and, and, and really have a proper conversation about it. There's, it raises a very interesting point about post-March 2019, how the UK government is going to effectively do the same thing, because if they will continue to follow the co-regulatory model, there'll still be this question about, so where are the skills around agreeing that that standard will meet that UK regulatory requirement, assuming that there is one, uh, and that that national standard will serve that purpose? Which brings us to your question, your question about the, the forward and the words. Well, of course, the key to a means of compliance is it, you have to meet the law in the country that the product is placed, where it is placed on the market. It doesn't matter if it meets the law in some other country. It, what matters is that the, the product meets the law of the country that you're in. The standard is a means to help you demonstrate compliance with that. We may well have to change the terminology in the front of that standard in order to say, and by the way, it meets the UK requ essential requirements as set out here. There will be a process that we call, I believe, designation, as opposed to citation. Currently, European standards are cited in the official journal. We will have a process where we designate the BS, British standard, in, in some government website. So that will be a form of using the same regulatory model, but the regulatory requirement may be the same, may be different. Frankly, in standards world, it doesn't really matter whether it is or isn't. We can manage small amounts of divergence, we can manage divergence in individual areas. All the countries of Europe do have divergence. They use deviations in the back of the standard. The standard may be identical, but it doesn't mean it's the same in every country. We've got lots of fireworks in Ireland, furniture fire safety in the UK, environmental protection in Spain. There's lots of divergence, and France and Germany use that more than any other country to, to have an, some sort of annex in the back for their own application. So we can manage divergence. It doesn't matter if the regulatory requirement is slightly different in the UK to in, in Europe. And we will have to make clear in the forward of the standard in the UK that it is or isn't offering compliance to UK essential requirements as set out here. Thank you, Scott. I think that <coughs> the number of hands that went up illustrates that we're going to have a lively panel discussion, so I want to move straight to it now so that we don't uh, waste any more time. So, Scott, why don't you come and uh, you. take this <coughs> seat? And can I ask the rest of our panellists to come up, please? That would be, uh, yeah, that would be sure. excellent. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Thanks Thanks for for yeah. So that was a where we are today look. Thank you, Stephen. Good to see you. All the best. Thank see you later, Richard. Thank Cheers. You. All the best. We're now going to look forward. We're now going to talk about how standards might be used uh, to support trade in a pro-Brexit world. And we brought together four excellent speakers. Um, we take seriously our responsibilities to ensure diversity. Uh, we failed in very many diversity measures with our, our speakers today. But there is diversity of thought, I can assure you, as you'll find out in a second. Um, so let's crack straight on. I'd like, to, first of all, to introduce Liam Smith, 
Uh, Liam is going to give us a business view. Liam is Director of Trade Facilitation at the British Chambers of Commerce. So you heard Stephen Phipson talk about the B5 and the British Chambers of Commerce being uh, one of those five. Um, Liam helps to devise and advocates policy positions for the UK's exit from the EU, uh, as well as being an expert on things like rules of origin, customs and uh, a trade facilitation policy. So Liam, your uh, members of the BCC are already heavily involved in international standards. Uh, so where, what does business see as the opportunities for global trade post-Brexit and where do you see standards fitting in that? Well, uh, first of all, can I uh, thank you for inviting me to, to be a part of your uh, session today uh, and also uh, mention how grateful we are to be involved with BSI in terms of the development of uh, uh, policy and working together and also uh, uh, that piece of work that we did earlier in the year to make sure that government understood the difference between uh, standards and regulation and the continuing role for BSI uh, as a UK rep uh, at uh, IEC and ISO. Um, look, standards uh, really matter to members, but here's the thing, is they don't all appre always appreciate at every turn just how much they matter because they trade day and daily. Um, our members do trade globally, many of them do, uh, and we know that because uh, as a Chamber of Commerce we also uh, um, operate a system of uh, certifying origin on behalf of government. And very often in the certifying of origin, what we're looking at the origin of goods, we're also looking at um, other pieces of certification from uh, bodies such as maybe the BSI or Lloyd's Register and others uh, that, are, that are saying that these goods meet the standards of the destination country. Um, in terms of global trade, we, we would see uh, you know, future global trade being a big opportunity for our members. But that was always the case, whether with Brexit or, or not. And actually, for our members, the big concern they have is about the very near market that they globally trade with, uh, which is the EU, uh, the 27 nations of the EU, where substantial trade takes place. And importantly, as uh, Stephen mentioned earlier, they are very often part of a very highly integrated uh, supply chain, um, where because of the role that standards play, actually, when they're part of a supply chain, both the buyer and the seller understand um, what it is that they're producing, what standards they're, they're producing uh, those goods to, and can be confident about what they're receiving so, uh, and, and how they're trading. And so, uh, actually, uh, I think we often talk about BSI as being a, a standard maker, not a standard taker, but actually, you know, for, 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 for businesses, being standard makers in the UK is a good thing. There's a, a line of sight into uh, and through uh, the, the industry bodies on the drafting and development of those standards and many of you in the room today we've already heard from are coming from those industry bodies. That's an important role that you, that you play. Um, in terms, just to mention in future global trade, one of the things that we've done recently and we do regularly is an international trade study and we ask uh, members about their intentions to trade um, uh, in the next 12 months, next 18 months and so on and we talk to them about um, barriers to trade. We've kind of, since Brexit, changed some of the questions and we've talked to them, re really uh, asked them about um, uh, what their intentions are or what are the things that they consider and think about before either entering a market uh, or um, either exporting to or importing from a market. And it may interest you to know that, just for context, they'll mention the principal uh, concern they have is uh, about uncertainty. So that's the thing, everybody's on everyone's lips and your questions indicate that around the standards uh, uh, industry there's uncertainty as well. Um, and then uh, you go to a question which really is around um, uh, the, the administration and regulatory barriers either in the UK or in, in the EU or in overseas markets. And actually whilst around 50% are concerned about uncertainty, 40% about the value of the pound and, and uh, currency, about a third are concerned about regulatory matters. And to give you a further context to that, only around one in five are concerned about migration and movement of people. So that tells me that it features very highly uh, in considering markets that, that business is either importing or exporting to. Um, and, and so, you know, it's important that businesses continue to understand that there is at least some reassurance and certainty around uh, standards going forward. There's a lot of talk at the moment uh, about the, uh, our future training uh, relationships. In particular, government's consulting at the moment on Australia, New Zealand, US, and also uh, the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership countries. Um, I, I just 
because I was coming here, was interested to know, of all, are all of those countries signed up to the international bodies? And of course, you'll know as I didn't, that pretty much they are, either are members or are affiliates or associates. And on the one hand, you say, well, well, that's great. So when it comes to free trade agreements, we needn't worry too much. We're all operating to the same international standards. But of course, signed up and member doesn't mean that, they, that there aren't some uh, application of different standards in, in those countries that we need to get our head around. But at least we're at the same table in many respects uh, with those, those countries when we're signing up to do uh, business with mm. them. Um, so, you know, the application of uh, international standards clearly is our best option. Mm -hmm. Stepping aside, as you mentioned earlier, Scott, in, uh, in developing your own standards, uh, important to look, first of all, is there something there already? But there's very good reason at times why we need to have our own interpretation, our own version of, uh, of those standards to protect uh, the people, uh, uh, the consumers and the businesses in our nation. So, um, you know, business will continue to mm -hmm. do, do trade, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah. We're in a period of uncertainty, uh, 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 but there are some fundamentals that underpin the way that we trade, and standards is without question one of those. Thank you, Liam. And some of the people that, inf that provide that influence that you talked about internationally are in the room, so we have lots of chairs of international European standards committees in the room today. Um, but the points that you've just made segues nicely into our next speaker. David Hennig is a, a renowned trade policy expert, being the UK director at the trade policy think tank, European Centre for International Political Economy. Before that, he was in government and worked on the EU-US trade deal, TTIP. More of that later, I'm sure. Um, but David... Um, You've seen it from the inside of government. Trade deals, as we know them, are mainly regulatory. Um, how do you see standards fitting with it? You heard Liam's optimism that the fact that we work together on standards might just um, uh, make trade uh, super uh, frictionless. Yes, I, and I, I'm not going to be quite as uh, optimistic, I think, mainly because I've, we've been told we need, need to show diversity here. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I think I'd start with the same point that a number of people have already made. Barriers to trade are all important. But I recall during the TTIP talks um, being contacted by a, a crane maker, I think, in the, uh, in the UK, who said that, um, can we fix this particular area of discrimination as a US standard, which has been, it's clearly been developed by the, U the US industry um, to basically exclude their, their product, mm. something to do with weatherproofing, and I don't go into uh, detail, but it, it reminds me that at one level, trade agreements are all about the detail. So, you know, we've been talking about big systems, and are we part of all these big systems? But actually, a really big question is, um, you know, what is it? Oh, am I not yeah. my microphone yeah. on? Right. Hang on. A bit louder. Try again. Try again. Yeah. So, is it still not coming through, is it? Oh, well, carry on. So, yeah, the, the, the big question of detail yeah. Yeah. is, you know, how much detail do we have? What do we know about these markets? Where have we got problems? Mm. Mm. Um, and so that's a large part of trade deals. Now, the other part is the big sort of overall systemic question. What is the relationship between regulations, conformity assessment, and standards? Mm -hmm. And actually, trade deals typically don't include that much about standards. Mm -hmm. It might surprise you. But ultimately, because it's a voluntary system, that typically standards merely set, the text often just says it needs to be part of the... Uh, this way of operating on standards. Conformity assessment then is a more interesting question, things like can you test against a standard mm. outside of country, and regulations, can mm. we align these particular regulations? The exception is of course the US, that's the big exception, there are others, where obviously their standard system, they wish to recognise international standards to a different definition than we do in the UK, and that will cause problems. Um, so I think it might, that might be enough on the sort of the overview of, of, mm -hmm. of trade deals. It's about real specifics and then it's about big picture stuff. Thank you, David. And we will come to you for some questions in a second, so please be, uh, you're on notice. Um, another aspect of the future trade arrangement is the compliance side and the enforcement and consumer rights. I'm very pleased that Ben Richards has joined us. Ben is the Campaigns and Policy Executive at the Chartered Trading Standards Institute. Um, so, Ben, how, how do you see an emphasis on trade with the rest of the world impacting on enforcement and what's the role for standards to, to, to minimise any negative aspects? Well, thank you, and I want to repeat uh, what's been said about BSI's work in this area, uh, differentiating standards from the uh, overall uh, trade uh, withdrawal agreement. I need to be clear on my terms. Um, 
as we stand. I think for trading standards and I think for enforcement in general, um, there's, there's quite a lot of this that can be said as, even if we weren't sat here today discussing Brexit, a lot of these challenges would be here. And what Brexit has done is sh shone a very detailed light onto the challenges facing enforcers, mainly from resources. And I'll touch on that negative note a bit later on. But I think, first of all, uh, we, when the uh, EU uh, vote took place, we conducted some research looking into uh, the regulatory challenges from Brexit, and we have produced a very short summary document available in time for Christmas, um, which uh, I'm happy to give out uh, if anyone is interested in that. And that outlined three key areas uh, for us across uh, the full spectrum of trading standards work. The first of which being reciprocal networks and uh, non-regulatory uh, uh, issues. So things like the RAPEX network uh, and right the way across into food standards, RASEV as another example of that. That uncertainty, however, is where standards, I think, really can start playing a role. Uh, further to that is obviously the context of trading standards at the moment, and that is a 56% cut in resources. Uh, and our research has shown that about 30% of services feel they have the expertise to deal with legislation as it is at the moment. I'll repeat that, 30% think they have the expertise at the moment. That's the situation we are in as of a year ago. If we add complexity to our system through future trade deals, that will be a challenge for for enforcers at the moment. So, what does the enforcement system want? And the answer is simplicity, and that's where standards really can uh, help, is that in whatever deals that are coming forward, the knowledge that what the standard is provides an, a level of reassurance of conformity from a business they're dealing with is the level of certainty that enforcers want. And I think further to that, if we have a situation where there are competing standards, that will only add to bureaucracy within the local, uh, local enforcers and present a challenge to that expertise that is already stretched. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ben. I'm going to come, when well, I look for some hands from the audience so we can start to get the microphones in the right place. Uh, but while we do that, Scott, do you just want to reflect on what you've heard uh, from our speakers and in terms well, of uh, how you see standards supporting yes, trade Yes, thank you. I mean, I mean Dave, David has very wisely um, um, reminded us of, of the structure, and I think that's absolutely fantastic, to pull out the conformity assessment. Because, of course, whilst we've talked a lot this morning about the voluntary side, and I introduced the 10%, uh, and we've talked about the importance of simplicity in that, there are, there are big opportunities in trade agreements for, for uh, aligning test methods uh, between countries. That is a really sunk cost to manufacturers, and we know that from our TTIP discussions, David, if you remember. Uh, um, German manufacturers of cars saying, why do we have to crash test cars here and in the US? The consumer ends up paying for that. Can't we just agree on a test method? So in many areas where, where technical regulation, UNEC technical regulation, for example, is directing the, the regulatory requirements, Standards written by stakeholder engagement will be part of the test process for those products. Uh, not necessarily the levels that might be set in the regulation, but the test method. If we can align that, there's an opportunity. So I think there are, there are huge opportunities, uh, actually, to use our strength in international standards making to support and take a very, a very strong position in trade negotiations, including with our friends in the US about what they're going to do to guarantee reciprocal market access. Because the key in trade is reciprocity. Are you going to get access for your manufacturers uh, that is reciprocal to what we're going to give them? And if you don't have reciprocity, don't sign the deal. But in, in these areas of standards, the opportunities are, 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 are multiple when you see um, Countries around the world, thinking of Gulf states, for example, we heard last week in Geneva, the Gulf states have already moved to, to a, 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 an international standard structure. The Belt and Road countries, we need to encourage these countries to use the international standard just as we do in our industry, for our industries and our consumers and our, and our government. 
that would open those markets and avoid the problem that Liam mentioned, which is that you may have an international standard, but if the country's got another standard sitting in the back in that province or that state, that's the friction that we can't get past because we've only got one layer. So opportunity knocks. Well, right, so any questions or immediate observations from the floor? Two together, that's very helpful for our microphones. Uh, so we'll start, with, we'll start with these two, I think. Um, and let's take three or four before we, we go on. So then we have two, two here. So let's try and take all four, shall we, and see if they work. And, uh, so please, when you're ready. Um, good morning, everybody. My, my name's Graham Goring. I'm um, a committee member for BSI and IEC. Um, I, I'm involved in the aerospace industry, and so regulation is very important to us. Um, and I, I suppose I'm, I'm just nervous about the fact that we adopt all these standards in BSI, and they say EN. They don't say IEC, they say EN. Is that still going to be there? Um, does that mean we've got to think about how we identify the standards in the, in the UK? That, that's my main question. But certainly, the, the, I mean, I've just got involved in IECQ. Uh, I don't know whether you're aware that that's an area where the regulations um, mm. uh, are actually audited. And I've just been trained in that area for aerospace, for electronic components, to make sure that they meet the requirements. So it's been a very interesting exercise. But uh, that, that was my question about the adoption process mm. with, the, with IEC becoming an EN and then becoming a BSI standard. Mm. Okay, that's it. The next question, we'll come back to that. I'm, I'm afraid it's John Park again. Um, you've hinted at the Canada-Europe uh, trade agreement, which I have been following closely, obviously. Uh, again, it's about the, the mutual recognition. They've already looked at that for testing. But it would be nice for me to take a little bit more away from today than miles away from agreement. And I'm coming back to the CE marking, and if the UK has its own mark, and again, it's been alluded to, and that is mutual recognition. Will it need to be a two-stream system that there's one for the UK for its mark, and one for the European Union for its mark, or will theirs be recognised by us and vice versa? Because hmm. clearly working on behalf of Canada, where we hmm. have been uh, placing products on the single market, it's construction products that I'm interested in, will there suddenly have to be in Canada the adoption of a UK system and a European system? So it's going to be duplicating basically what is exactly the same thing doubling the cost for manufacturers. Yes. Yeah. Okay, and then from the front. Yeah. Uh, John Hull, um, formerly uh, working for a trading standard service that has had a 70% cut in the last 10 years, uh, but now a member of CPIN. And uh, my question really is, is in relation to what Ben has said uh, as regards expertise. Um, if we start to recognise different standards as meeting UK regulatory requirements, um, how on earth is a trading standards professional mm. who has got the certainty at the moment of a BSEN standard and one standard to, do, to look at and say it complies with this, going to handle standards from potentially anywhere in the world? And I come from a position of having done some work on behalf of the EU in, in a foreign country, which I won't name, um, where we did look at a, happened to be a GOSH standard, uh, compared to a British standard for COTS, and whereas it would pass the GOSH standard very easily, this particular COT we looked at, no way would it pass a British standard or a European standard for safety for babies. So, you know, how, how is the UK going to handle that regulatory requirement if we haven't got the expertise at the moment. Mm. Wow, very good. So, Ben, maybe on this last point there, this is the simplicity, simplicity. presumably, you were talking about, and the challenge for you know, resource-strapped trading standards officers. I think that's a major question to government at the moment, is how do you prepare our enforcement systems for a, a post-Brexit environment? Uh, the government published uh, earlier this year a consumer green paper, which began talking about having some sort of national body that will do something more than we currently have in terms of enforcement. 
But I think what that doesn't answer is the question, as you say, 70% cut back in resources in, in one office, 80% in some places, what that looks like at a local level and how that body can actually step in when expertise starts to dip. Because the problem is, and, and the NAO said this back in 2016, at the moment the government really doesn't have a measure of what our capacity is at a local level. And all, all Brexit does is cause a focus on that. And if there were two competing standards or if there was a, a situation where there was a need for more capacity, at the moment we simply can't answer the question of where we stand now, let alone asking, well, are we ready to train those officers to provide that level of expertise? So I think it's a real challenge to government as we come into 170 days till Brexit. Um, what are they going to do post-Brexit and, and start build, working on now to make sure we have an enforcement capacity ready for trade deals and the standards that we may have to deal with then? David? So, um, just a little... Is this yet working? <laughs> My microphone yet working? Just a little bit um, of an issue around uh, this is that... I mean, even, even at the moment, as my understanding, you do have the situation where, you know, the standard is only one way of demonstrating conformity. Yeah. There already is a question mark. Every year, the US uh, authorities have great fun by doing a random test of European yeah. products and find large numbers of them faulty. I mean, I actually think that there's a bigger problem here than just the, just the, just the Brexit problem and the future relationship with the, with the EU. And in our trade deals, Scott just said, they are mutual. We will have to offer things. I don't think we'll be mutually recognising standards. I think that's a very important distinction which Scott kind of drilled into me some, some years ago. But we will be, you know, we intend to be relatively open in terms, of, in terms of trade. That openness could include being open to other ways of achieving safety in a product. So we do need to, you know, that adds to your point that you need more resources. We're all agreeing with you on that, yeah, I think. Absolutely. I think, may I? May I yeah. Sorry. Um, I, I think David's on to an important point here. The, the key is the mutual recognition of the regulatory outcome, mm. not the standard. I might say to, to you, I recognise that in your country you have a regulatory process that controls the quality and safety of your product and your process. I recognise that the outcome of that process is good enough for my, my country. If you recognise the outcome of my process is good enough for yours. I'm not recognising your standards or how you do it. I'm recognising the outcome of the process. And we have examples of that already, which, which I quote from, from uh, um, other walks of life, but extradition is a very good example where we recognise the outcome of other countries' judicial processes leading to extradition requests. We don't recognise how they do it. We recognise that the outcome is comparable to our own very rigorous process. So that's not often understood, but it's a very good example of how mutual recognition works when you say, I'm the regulator, I'm the government, I recognise that what you're trying to do is achieving within the bounds that David points out, of you know, all sorts of other problems, that the process is the same. Can I, should I pick up on the other questions, the one about the labelling? Um, about 85% of IEC standards are identical ENs already, and there are many in the electronic community who wish to push that up into the 90s. It will never go to 100, because there'll always be an interest of, of British and European electrotechnical industry to be able to write some homegrown standards. Um, but it's pretty close. So they are already BSEN IECs. Uh, uh, if they're ISOs, BSEN ISOs. I mentioned earlier that there are, of course, a, a body of ENs. There's no such thing as a white label EN. It doesn't exist. It only exists as an adoption of a country. It only exists as a BS or an Irish standard or a German standard. It doesn't exist as a white label EN. Uh, that's, that's the obligation. So that body of standards is additive to the international standards because there's an additional standards requirement in the market that means we've worked together on an additional standard. It's not a competing or conflicting standard. So the labelling is an important point, but, but it's simply a reference. And as we move to machine-readable standards, you won't even know what the reference is in a few years' time. 
But I think you're right on that point, just if I get into the deep technical issues behind it. I know in Senelec, they do tend to just put EN and then a 50,000 or 60,000 series number. Yeah. And sometimes the IEC designation does get dropped down. But it we should be there. It is it, technically it, it there. Will, it will be referenced certainly mm. in the foreword of the, of the standard. There was a question sure. about the IECQ mm. and mm. CE marking and uh, a, a mutual recognition of marks. And, and that, we talked a little bit about that earlier on. Again, I think there's a lot to, to discuss here, whether a British mark, a UK mark, is recognised in Europe and a CE mark recognised here in, in the UK in future. Frankly, I, I don't know, and it's going to be a government decision anyway. But I would point out that CE marking is not universal in the Sen and Senelec membership community. Switzerland doesn't require CE marking. So if you want to buy a cuckoo clock in Switzerland, uh, it may not have a CE mark on it. That manufacturer is meeting the law in Switzerland, but is hoping that that product doesn't find itself across the border in Germany, where it will be illegal, because it doesn't have a CE mark on it. So most Swiss manufacturers put the CE mark on it, because they download it from the internet, stick it on their cuckoo clock, and then sell the cuckoo clock in other countries. But they don't have to. So construction products in Switzerland don't have to have a CE mark if they stay in Switzerland. So there are other models, but I understand from the government announcements last week that there will be a UK mark, and suddenly you're into this problem of recognising it. Mm. And presumably, Liam, your members have a concern about this and, UK and mark. Of course, of course, they do. I think we should, we should all be concerned that, uh, we really, uh, about that, because we, we mustn't forget that whilst we talk about standards and embedding them, and should they be part of an FTA, or is that about regulation and so on, there's a reality out there in the world which is actually just called trade flows, and it's the yes. goods that move across borders. And you know, at the border, trading standards, I think, are one of 27 agencies who uh, uh, may have the ability to intervene. And at this point, I really wanted to talk about the, the, uh, the, the, the flow at the border. And so whilst resources are clearly an issue from uh, the comments made about cut, cutting resources, we have to uh, look to, I think, the uh, uh, trade facilitation agreement and, it, and its aim for one window at the border. And what does that mean, actually? It means that physically there isn't really a window, uh, but the idea that actually there's a sharing of common data amongst agencies who have uh, a mutual, uh, well, there's mutual need for that data, they have mutual access to it, so that you can utilise technology to identify those interventions that are required to ensure compliance uh, takes place. And I know that our members, of course, want as frictionless border as we can have. Um, the idea that Brexit will deliver frictionless trade is uh, fantastic, but actually we don't have it at the moment, yeah. even within yeah. a free market, yeah. and we ought not to pretend that we have. Yeah. Uh, we have many interventions uh, uh, at, the, uh, at the border, and for good reason very often. Um, so, you know, important as a kite mark is, if it's a kite mark or a British standard, if it's a British standard, um, it, it's, it's another change, and it will mean that our customers around the globe will need to um, uh, you know, be educated on that and we, we mustn't ever assume that because we make an edict and we say that this is a new kite mark that the border guard at uh, Alexander Port in Egypt understands that. Yeah. You know, yeah. and then that's just the reality. Every change you make then needs to be reflected in trade agreements yeah, because yeah, if you yeah, want exactly. this to be re yeah. recognised, then that's why yeah. trade agreements take so long. Yeah. It's full yeah. of this yeah. kind of detail. Yeah. I think one, one of the important yeah. points we haven't touched on but we've skirted around, uh, and I'll start with an anecdote, is a German manufacturer told me once, uh, uh, a famous British newspaper rang up and said, how do we check standards at the border? And I said, we don't. No. Where would you start? A German manufacturer told me there were 10,000 standards to make a car. So which one are you going to test and where and how? Yeah. So, but, but in the high risk areas, we, we've talked about high risk products. If mm. We will have this same regulatory framework. So market regulation in the UK post March 2019 is not going to change. That's my understanding. Uh, which means the system of trading standards, uh, all mm. that we've discussed. The area we haven't talked about heavily, but is very, very important, is the notified body area. And, and that uh, 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 challenge for manufacturers in the UK who are required yep. to get a CE mark in order to, to, to demonstrate, not just voluntarily, but they have to go through a process. And there's a huge uh, activity going on amongst the notified bodies, a vast uh, uh, area of expertise in the UK, and how that's going to be addressed in future. But I suspect that many notified bodies in the UK will already have made plans to set up in a European jurisdiction in future so that they can serve British clients as well. Mm. Okay. Let's take the next group of questions. We've probably got time for two rounds of questions. So we've, uh, if we can get the microphone to the... 
to the middle here. Oh, there's a microphone already there, so do you want to go first, and then we'll get you, you guys here. Good, good afternoon. Positive. My name's William Smith. Right. I'm director at Galvanizers Association. Uh, our membership is within the UK and the Irish uh, region, so I have particular interest in the Irish border and how that'll settle. But I have to come back to the C marking, and your, your comments just now, uh, Scott, on the notified bodies. So my question is on behalf of all the steel fabricators, small and large, who provide the customer base for our industry, how will we continue to influence the group of notified bodies in the future, which provide the guidance to the third party attestation companies who yeah. are going into the steel fabrication companies and assessing them against the requirements for compliance to allow the CE marking to be applied. If there's a difference in approach within the EU and within the UK region, this could yeah. cause a significant disparity in the marketplace. Yeah, good question. Okay, let's come back to that. I think we've got a couple of questions here in the middle. We can just uh, a microphone yeah. here. David, do you want to talk about that? Hello, Mike Inman. Um, I'm a regulatory and compliance manager for a test equipment manager for fire detectors, and we make declarations of conformity naming standards as BSEN. After Brexit, would that have to be a, a German standard? or will we still be able to quote BSENs on our declaration, which is following the European yeah. template? Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. Would you want to pass the microphone over to Chloe? Yeah, hi, it's uh, Tony Reynolds from uh, Lorien Engineering Solutions. Again, following on from what Mike has said, um, machinery directive, declarations of conformity and incorporation. Um, what's going to happen with the declaration? Because it asks for the name and address of a person who compiles a technical file must be part of the community. Mm -hmm. um, are we going to be doing two declarations, one for the UK with this UKC type mark yeah. and one also for Europe? Yep. The Declaration of Conformity will come <laughs> back <laughs> to that one. And a question there, please. Oh, hi, it's uh, Paul Pope from Apollo Fire Detectors in the UK and board member of the FIA Fire Institute, Fire, Fire Institute Association. And my question is, we are a UK global company that holds over a thousand international approvals and we operate in fire detection systems manufacturing worldwide. Yeah. But what we have seen is areas of the world which were predominantly British influenced and European standard influenced, all those now being diminished in certain territories by other very important standards. We have those standards as a company and we're operating with those products but going forwards, what do we do? Yeah. yeah. Curious, so maybe Scott, you can yeah, come I back can in a second that. about yeah. Um, yeah. how influential yeah. we, our standards can be. Does anyone want to pick up, David, do you want to pick up this point about uh, declaration uh, of conformity? I will try to start on conformity assessment. It's an area I've tried to follow vaguely, and there will be, I, mean, I, I, I know there's people in this room who will know more about it than me, but the big, the big issue we're going to face is, of course, that the EU conformity assessment system, the notified bodies, um, only apply to EU members. Now, they'll apply to us in the transition period, but where there is, well, once we are out of a transition period, even if we have a free trade agreement with the EU, mm. any mutual rec there are mutual recognition of conformity assessment agreements, yes. for example, within Canada. Yes. They don't cover all products no, for a start. No. They are to, to specific Correct. products. We're kind of basically out of the notified body structure, although we would then have our own <laughs> notified, notified bodies. So this is all actually quite complex, and I... I'm afraid I haven't seen very much in the last year or two, nothing like as much as I've seen on standards, on how this is all going to affect us. Mm -hmm. Suffice to say, from what I've seen, this is going to affect us in quite a big way yeah. um, on, on, on conformity assessment. So I don't, I don't fully know the, the answer, but I know it's a, big, it's, a bi it's a big issue and it's something that we should all be uh, pushing a little harder And as Stephen says, even the Secretary of State is only talking still about the withdrawal agreement, the, yeah. the future trade agreement is something different. Scott, do you want to come in on that? Yes, so let me, let me follow up on that, David, thank you. So, the, uh, the system as we see it emerging, and now I'm, I'm giving general advice as Director of Standards, I'm not talking about uh, a conformity assessment in detail, but the general principle, as David has outlined, is that there are recognition of notified bodies outside the EU in, through trade agreements, but on a very limited basis. 
And the problem is the UK, of course, has, I don't know, something like 400 notified bodies in the UK, covering all the directives, massive expertise in medical devices, for example. In fact, the bulk of European capacity for medical devices uh, is in the UK, and the bulk of medical device products come through the UK uh, into Europe. So this is going to be a very interesting and important one to sort out. The, the plan B the, that, I, that I know, you, you know, to get notified body status in any uh, uh, EU jurisdiction country, including the UK today, is a process that takes a minimum of 18 months. So if notified bodies today haven't already taken steps to do something about the future, they are not going to be able to serve their customers uh, post-March 2019 because they will not get up the curve. But setting up a notified body in a European country, anybody can do that. You can't just plant a flag and move some, some of your people here, over there. You need to have a genuine operation staffed by people of that country who are expert, who meet the, the, that government's requirements for the notified body. So to, to my understanding, UK notified bodies today, or shall I say correctly, notified bodies in the UK today that are accredited by UCAS will become UK notified bodies in the UK post-March 2019 because the model of regulatory structure for the market doesn't change. That doesn't mean that they would necessarily be notified body in the EU. So they either have taken steps to create an operation in the EU to serve their clients or they are not going to be able to serve that market. Now it's totally correct and there are many examples already today of, of uh, organisations who are not European who have notified bodies in Europe today and they offer their clients that service today, sitting under European uh, 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 jurisdiction, offering their customers from I don't know, China, America, uh, that service. So British notified bodies based in the UK today will, and I know a number already, have moved setting up operations in Europe so that manufacturers can continue to have their products tested in the UK as today, the certificate assessed and issued from the, uh, the notified body based in a European country. That's totally normal and, and, and above board, of course, because it's meeting the European uh, legal requirements to place a product on that market. So that's already been worked out. And if you have any questions, you need to ask your notified body, whoever that is, uh, uh, what they're doing about it and how they're going to look after you post-March 2019. But all notified bodies worth their salt have already worked that out. So there is a solution there uh, in process. To the question about the BSEN labelling, UK is going to continue as a full member of Sen and Senelec. The EN label is simply two letters on a piece of paper that signifies the origin of that document. It will continue to be called a BSEN and you will no doubt continue to say it's a BSEN because that is uh, the identical standard. Uh, I want to just chip in on that one as well. It's David, go for it. Um, was that actually stand standards as a UK export um, success story and high quality, uh, high quality products is something we really need to emphasise in our future trade yeah. policy. Scott is not just emphasising standards, he is an exporter as well and quite a successful exporter. Yes. So we need to do more of that. The UK, UK. I, there's, a, there's a good question. So, so just to make this back up on this point about BSENs and, and your labelling, uh, I, you'll need advice on this, but of course at the end of the day, your product is going to go on the market in Germany, and if there were some, some uh, deviations in that standard, the standard, the EN, the BSEN and the German EN would be identical, but of course there may be some differences in that standard. You of course are declaring that you're meeting that, using that standard as a declaration of conformity and placing the product on the market in Germany, but you have to meet the German legal requirements. So that's just as today. So I don't see any change in, in any of that. I wanted to pick up on this point about, about around the world and the very interesting comment about um, territories and territories around the world that you hinted at that are uh, 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 being influenced by um, barriers to trade through other standards unspecified. Um, we are working closely with FCO, who have been really supportive in China, to support a, a strategy on the Belt and Road countries, which are a, a large block of countries now around the world, to help the, 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 
Chinese government, working with those Belt and Road countries, use and adopt a single international standard model, replacing and withdrawing local standards in those territories. That's the strategy we're, we have. It's a very, very important strategy because if you don't deliver that, then there is a tendency for other standards to creep in, either local standards that are legacy, that exist already, or, let's say, other standards from other for a consortia or organizations that, that are then adopted in those countries. In the Gulf states, we've had very good uh, uh, examples of challenge uh, in that area in the past. The Gulf is now moving on into uh, a more mature uh, uh, structure. Uh, but through our recently announced Commonwealth Standards Network, we're, we're trying very hard through that structure, Canada, Australia, UK, and, and, and we have over 30, 35 Commonwealth mm -hmm. countries signed up for this. Prime Minister announced it in the Guildhall um, uh, earlier this year. Uh, uh, DFID has put some support behind it, and for the first two years, we'll run technical assistance projects. But the idea is to support those Commonwealth countries to upskill, update, and adopt and use uh, international standards as we do in, in our countries. So all the countries that were mentioned earlier are indeed all members of ISO. They're not necessarily all members of the IEC, but they're all members of ISO, and our mission here is to support them to use international standards, withdrawing old-style national standards. And, and Liam, one of the upsides of Brexit was going to be companies looking for new export markets and who driving. Said that? Driving. <laughs> a, I can't remember who. He's, he's not in government now. But yeah. uh, do you, is that what your members are telling you? They're all looking for how to get into Chile. But, but actually, m members already. Uh, uh, you know, the, the idea that exporters uh, wake up in the morning and think, you know what, I'll do. I'll go to Chile. Is, is just not what happens. I mean, typically what happens is they receive, receive an inquiry, sometimes because they're already trading with one division of a company who have another division. It usually happens and often happens by osmosis, particularly for SMEs and supply chain companies, not big infrastructure uh, companies uh, that, that are going for you know, big long-term projects. And you know, for, for those companies, actually, one of the reasons they get the call, David mentioned it, and BSI successful as an exporter, is because actually UK standards, quality of product that we produce, is seen as being you know, at the top end. Um, I, and I'm reminded of a, an anecdote you talked about one earlier about someone that told me they'd received some product uh, from China, had a CE mark on it, and when they inquired about how they got the CE mark, they said, well, that means Chinese export. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and the, you know, the Chinese manufacturer bearings thought that, that was fair enough to put that stamp on. So, you know, we have a reputation for producing good quality, as Germany has and Switzerland has and so on, other countries, particularly in engineering and manufacturing. And I think we can uh, utilise that brand and, of course, our government and the government bodies have been taking exporting as great around the world over uh, the last couple of years in particular with some intensity. Uh, I have no doubt that we, we will, uh, you know, we, we're the UK, we're a trading nation. We're, we will trade our way out of this. Mm -hmm. It's the peace in the middle the uncertainty, the impasse where all this change takes a place, uh, is taking place that will really slow us down for a bit. No matter what happens uh, with you know, a customs arrangement or not customs arrangement, um, what the nature of the Irish border question uh, uh, results in being, the nature of the withdrawal agreement, the nature of the trade agreement with the EU, um, you know, things are going to slow down and so companies will have to get out there. And the appetite for UK product at the moment is high. Why? The value of sterling is pretty low, mm. yeah. you know. That's so, uh, you know, bear that in mind. Let's grab the last yeah. group of questions now. So, if you've got a burning question, this is your opportunity to uh, to, to have it uh, have it aired. Remember, we also have a lunch as well. Um, yeah. we, there's another opportunity. So, de first at the front, and then uh, Kate at the back. Hi, it's Phil Brown from Pilkington. I'd just like to challenge Scott on, on something he said around BSENs. I, I think he's perhaps simplified it uh, in our sector, construction products regulation. References to the EU CPR and Annex ZA are right through the documents. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the case of simply putting a, a, a brand new front cover on. I think it'll, these standards will have to be significantly changed yeah, yeah, yeah. if there's going to be a UK conformity mark. And we may even end up with a different number, which yeah. makes things you know, even more complicated yeah. for yeah. companies who trade both in the EU and the UK. Yeah. So I think there's a, it's, a lot less, it's a lot more complex than perhaps uh, Scott's yeah. indicator there. Yep, that's a fair point, I think. A uh, question at the back, Kate, and then we have okay, one at the front. Mine is a question more Richard. on funding and resource, because it's very clear I work in IT and AV that places like Korea, Japan, and China 
are being well supported in making their contributions to standardization. And obviously, up till now, perhaps the government has relied on the fact that research projects under H2020 had a standardization role and therefore some funding. But all we've been talking about means that standardization is important to the UK. Is the government going to address some of the funding hole? Yeah. Good, thank you. Government funding. Another question. Uh, Jack Semple from EMA again. Um, I wondered, we've heard that there's going to be a UK mark. Uh, have we got any uh, sort of overall view as to what the benefit of that is going to be? And perhaps as a pointer to start, where, where the, the greatest enthusiasm for the UK mark has come from? Yeah, yeah. good question. And two more. The final, these will have to be the final two, I'm afraid. But there's one here at the front and then Mike at that one at the back. The back um, first. Mine was just a, a clarification on the notified body status when they move their operation to certificate within Europe. It doesn't end there because the manufacturers who hold UK notified body certification and a CPR number on their products have to change that number to the new European yes. number. And at what point does that happen? On the day, the 29th, does that happen then? It also is significant because that product certification is used internationally as well outside of Europe. And it's also used, for example, in the Middle East for civil defence approvals, which could also run out. Yeah. So trade barriers, products entering countries, if it doesn't happen on the day, all those products and thousands of products that we manufacture and thousands of uh, in, in, in approvals, that just doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. It's a big risk. Yeah. I don't think a plan B can work for that, yeah. other than recertifying all of our products through a European-based uh, notified body now. Yeah. And it takes time, the clock's ticking, right? Last yeah. question. Um, Hideo Takano, how is England? Um, if we are to introduce uh, a UK mark to run alongside the C mark or whatever, does that mean the end of harmonised standards? And if so, does that in turn mean that the construction product regulation where you have to use um, products, oh, sorry, that are CE marked for, with, with harmonized standards um, is, is over. And if it isn't, um, who will be policing it and who will be sort of um, issuing fines for infractions and things? Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Right, Scott, do you want to go first? Then we go along the line. Mostly me, that one. So. Um, you are absolutely right. I mean, there's a general conversation, but I think that the area of construction products, it is a lot more complicated. Um, it always was complicated, uh, and when, when they regulated that space, it became really complicated. So I know that um, uh, DHCLG are, are talking about this. They were talking about this last week. Uh, um, how are we going to deal with this? What is it going to look like? What is going to be the parallel for construction products in the UK? And, and how does the marking going to work, and so on. Um, harmonized, the word harmonized is very emotive. It was very emotive in TTIP. It's always very emotive. What I'm, what I'm saying is that the UK will continue, that's what our stakeholders want and I'm trying to deliver, the identical standards. You will have a coherent, consistent national catalogue made up almost entirely of international standards. The fact that they are used in conjunction with a European regulation is a matter for, for them. The fact that it's used in conjunction with a British regulation is a matter for us. Uh, the standard is identical. It may not be the same. We've talked about that. So this is just a question for MHCLG about when they become a designating body, as all the ministries will, they will be designating that standard probably in a very similar way, depending on how the construction products industry argue the case, that standard is there to be used. Or the ministry, the department, may choose to write a technical regulation. They can do that today. They don't like doing that because it means they take responsibility for the levels of safety in, 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 in the regulation as opposed to relying on the standard and pointing at it and in all the other arguments for it. But they can do that today. So the standard is there as a tool to be used by government uh, but I agree warmly with you that the construction products area is an area we probably need a special meeting 
<coughs> to talk about construction products alone. Uh, and I would encourage, if you want to talk to our team, Ant Bird is the lead expert in that area. If I turn to the funding and resources question, yes, so um, funding and resources, always a problem. What's the government going to do about it? Well, you'll be delighted to know, I hope, that, um, um, well, maybe half delighted to know, that we've made serious progress in this area. Whereas a few years ago, I'd have been sitting here saying to you, government doesn't know who we are. I'm pleased to say that in these areas of, of, of innovation, catapults, uh, uh, all this area, Made Smarter Review on, on manufacturing, standards are embedded as a requirement. The Made Smarter Review had its meeting, first meeting with Jürgen Meyer a few days ago. The, uh, there's an obligation on those funded programs to think about and use standards as part of that process. So there is funding in there, and government has based particularly has been really supportive uh, uh, of using the standards uh, process as a tool and supporting and funding uh, projects in this area. Whether that extends, I'm, I should credit Bayes for, for their commitment to the uh, um, funding for, for travel for experts. That has been maintained. Uh, we were told uh, last week austerity has ended. Who knows? We'll, you know, we'll keep pushing. But you need to push too because I'm pushing hard and Bayes has responded uh, but but uh, we're not going to end up with a fully funded standard system mm -hmm. because that's not our culture uh, and it's not necessarily uh, uh, appropriate. But there is a lot more resource flowing in and a lot more interest from government uh, in this area. And we talked about numbers on certificates. I'm not an expert on this, but um, where are you? Numbers on certificates, yes. But um, I would encourage you to talk to, to I mean, I can give you the name of people who know exactly what's happening in this area. But um, I'm sure that's going to be part of the withdrawal agreement is how that works with the numbering. Um, you're correct. I, I believe that the number of the certificate has to, will change. It will be a new certificate issued with a new number. But I, I'm quite confident that there will be a transition period of that while that goes on. In the end, uh, you will need to have, I suspect, from my limited understanding, a, a certificate issued from the notified body that will probably have a different number on it. But I know the man to, to put you in touch with. I think, can I just add to something on there, on <coughs> that very issue? We have the same issue with certificates of origin, both for preference to the EU and non-preference to the rest of the world. The, the, the time is 11 o'clock on the 29th of March. Uh, one minute past 11, it's uh, on a hard Brexit. You know, we, we are no longer in the EU, we're not part of any arrangement. One, one minute past 11 with uh, some kind of withdrawal agreement uh, uh, and trading agreement, then we're in a different place. We're, we're in a period of transition uh, uh, for, for what we're doing until December 2020. Or indeed, maybe longer, depending yeah, yeah, what happens yeah. today slash tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, so there is, a, there is a point at which everything changes and we have to restate some things that have already happened. Yeah. That's just a cost of uh, apparently taking back control. And, and David, do you see ex an extension of the transition period? Is that likely? Ah. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. So, well, well, well forever. I'll take, I'll, I mean, an extension forever. Look, let me just <laughs> let me just say say a word about that, and then a word about what I think you all need to be doing, because I've got a standard uh, the standard thing I say to put pressure on, on 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 government, which is, yeah, it's quite likely that we are, you know, no trade deal. We've got a transition period currently forecast till December 2020. The EU can't do a trade deal in 21 months, even if we no. could do one, which no. I doubt we could. Yeah. Yeah. The EU cannot do that. The yeah. chances are, I've estimated it between five and ten years to negotiate a new trade agreement with the, with the EU. Even then, you might have a transition period for introducing that. So we are talking about a considerable period of transition. Now, this leads me into the sort of the standard thing I say to all businesses is there's going to be a lot of complexity here. We don't exactly know the withdrawal agreement even will cover every last detail. Mm. Mm. EU law is complex. You need to, you or your trade association, many of you are trade associations, need to get to know your contacts in government in the different departments, mm. whether it's Bayes or DCLG or whoever it is, and you need to be putting pressure on them and saying, this is my specific issue. Yeah. And you know, I, you might not be able to deal with it now, but I will need answers. And just keep mm -hmm. pushing them. This is my specific issue. And there are a lot. You'll, you'll have seen the government is recruiting <coughs> a lot more people, and you need to take advantage of that while they are trying to record all of these issues. Mm -hmm. Because when, with the best will in the world, they can't solve them all today, tomorrow. So you just need to keep plugging away, 
on them and make sure you have those contacts in place. Yeah. And, and, then, and, and as Scott will know, you mustn't ever assume that the government know and are aware and have on the radar the thing that's bothering you, yeah. um, which is all the more reason why yeah. BSI have people in secondment, because actually yeah. that's applying some yeah. uh, expertise and resource. The Chamber yeah. Network have people in secondment yeah. too in government. Uh, and actually, um, uh, from the cynic in me at the outset of that thought it might not be any use. Uh, the reality is quite different, I, I, I yeah. hope you share the same thing, that actually government is open, is listening, mm -hmm. is uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, soaking up uh, knowledge and expertise. So, And the good news is there's some government officials in the room, they keep their heads down but they're listening, so they're here. Yeah. Uh, ben, so what, just to finish, what's your uh, request of government? Well, I'll, I'll take the, the point on the construction products as, mm. a, as a real example here. Mm. When that came in, we, we get a, a number of questions on this. and. Is it going to be a priority for trading standards at a local authority level? The answer was, well, we just look at our research. Local issues come to the fore every single time. And so when there are non-compliant products on, on the market and manufacturers point them out, the answer is it, it isn't actually a local priority. So coming back to what we would be saying to, to national government is, first of all, don't place standards as a pawn on the table when it comes to, to deals, mainly because we would question whether enforcement is ready to have conflicting mm. standards mm. when they're dealing with things. And our second point would be is use Brexit as an opportunity to take a look at our enforcement uh, mm. level that could be right the way across from the local government block grant right mm. the way through to what is going on at a national mm. level to deal with issues that businesses care about, using construction products, for example, that don't come across into the, the criminal element that mm. a lot of trading standards work mm. nationally tends to focus mm. on. Mm. Scott, would you like to conclude? I, well, yes, and I'd like to, 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 to compliment Ben for that, that comment. The, what I'm really excited about this morning is that this is the first time that we've had a grown-up conversation, I don't mean this group, but I mean as a nation, we've had a national level conversation about what our market structure really looks like. We know bits of it, the bit our company was affected by or our product. We never had this kind of joined up conversation about conformity assessment, market surveillance, absolutely fundamental, uh, standards, regulatory framework. We never had that joined up conversation and I would toss into that mix intellectual property. So every market in the world has these, these tools and framework that support it that industry, business, consumers and government use. And they are, under the regulatory model, the intellectual property piece of it, conformity assessment, standards, all backed up by market surveillance. So understanding how these wheels interact and where the pressures need to go is really, really important. So I've learned a lot in the last two years myself about this, and I, I hope this morning's been useful to you. You can see that in the system we, we, we operate in the UK, I said earlier, it is regarded by academics as, as high tech, uh, the co-regulatory system. The role of market surveillance is really important, but market surveillance trading standards officers can't go out and, and test steel products that are coming over the dock in, in, in South Wales. They can't do that. So we have to have a, a mature and grown-up conversation about the overall structure. And I really welcome everybody's contribution and the fantastic questions and discussion we've had. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. Well, this isn't the end. We still have lunch, opportunity to network and to ask more questions in the panel. I, I hope we'll be able to stay around as well, and Richard is around if you have more questions for us. Um, as always, there'll be a feedback form as well, and we'd appreciate your feedback um, on, on today's, and we hope you found it useful, and do let us know uh, if there's anything else that you want us to consider for future events, because something tells me this won't be the last, uh, the last discussion on this topic. Uh, but before we go, will you join me in thanking the panel? Liam Smith, David Hennig. <laughs> and Ben Richards, and of course, Scott Stevens.